reward your inner child. Inside all of us, there are three distinct and totally separate ego states that work in concert to make up our unique personality. We have a parent-like ego, an adult ego, and a childlike ego, who act much the same way that parents, adults, and children do in real life. Your adult ego state is the rational part of yourself. It gathers data and makes logical decisions devoid of emotion. It plans your schedule, balances your checkbook, figures out your taxes, and determines when to rotate your tires. Your parent-like ego tells you to tie your shoes, brush your teeth, eat your vegetables, do your homework, exercise, meet your deadlines, and finish your projects. It has two sides to it. The negative side shows up as your inner critic, the part that judges you when you don't live up to its standards. The positive side shows up as the nurturing part of yourself that makes sure you're protected, taken care of, and provided for. It is also the part that validates, appreciates, and acknowledges you for doing a good job. Your childlike ego, on the other hand, does what all children do. It whines, begs for attention, craves hugs, and acts out when it doesn't get its needs met. As we go through life, it's almost as if we have a three-year-old holding on to us who's constantly asking, Why are we sitting at this desk? Why aren't we having more fun? Why am I still up at three in the morning? Why am I reading this boring report? As the parent of this inner child, one of your most important tasks is to engage it and reward it for behaving while you get your work done. If you had a three-year-old in real life, you might say, Mommy has to finish this proposal in the next twenty minutes, but after Mommy's done, we'll go for an ice cream or play a video game. Your real-life three-year-old would probably answer, Okay, I'll be good because I know I'm going to get something good at the end of it. Well, not surprisingly, your inner child is no different. When you ask it to be still, let you finish your work, stay up late, and so on, it will behave as long as it knows there's a reward at the end for behaving. At some point it needs to know it will get to read a novel, go to the movies, play with a friend, listen to music, go dancing, let loose, eat out, get a new toy, or take a vacation. A big part of creating more success in your life is rewarding yourself when you succeed. In reality, rewarding yourself for your successes keeps your inner child happy and compliant the next time it must behave while you work hard. It knows it can trust you to eventually deliver on your promises. If you don't, just like a real child, it will start to sabotage your efforts by doing things like getting sick, having accidents, or making mistakes that cost you a promotion or even your job, so that you are forced to take some time off and that will only take you farther away from the success you want to create. A Sense of Completion Another reason to celebrate your successes is that you don't feel complete until you have been acknowledged. It gives you a sense of accomplishment and recognition. If you spend weeks producing a report and your boss doesn't acknowledge it, you are left feeling incomplete. If you send someone a gift and they don't acknowledge receiving it, you end up with this sense of incompletion. There's this little incomplete taking up space inside your mind. Your mind needs to complete the cycle, thus freeing up space that would be better used focusing on your goals. Of course, even more important than just achieving a state of completion, the simple, enjoyable act of acknowledging and rewarding our successes causes your subconscious mind to say, Hey, succeeding is cool. Every time we produce a success, we get to do something fun. Jack will buy us something we want or take us someplace neat. Let's have more of these successes, so Jack will take us out to play more. Rewarding yourself for your wins powerfully reinforces your subconscious mind's desire to want to work harder for you. It's just basic human nature. Principle 27 Keep your eye on the prize. It's easy to be negative and unmotivated, but it takes some work to be positive and motivated. While there's no off button for those relentless tapes, there are things that you can do to turn down the volume and shift your focus from the negative to the positive. 
Donna Cardillo, RN, speaker, entrepreneur, humorist, and master motivator. Successful people maintain a positive focus in life no matter what is going on around them. They stay focused on their past successes rather than their past failures, and on the next action steps that will get them closer to the fulfillment of their goals rather than on all the other distractions that life presents to them. They are constantly proactive in the pursuit of their chosen objectives. The Most Important 45 Minutes of the Day An important part of any focusing regimen is to set aside time at the end of the day, just before going to sleep, to acknowledge your successes, review your goals, focus on your successful future, and make specific plans for what you want to accomplish the next day. Why do I suggest the end of the day? Because whatever you read, see, listen to, talk about, and experience during the last 45 minutes of the day has a huge influence on your sleep and your next day. During the night, your unconscious mind replays and processes this late-night input up to six times more often than anything else you experience during the day. This is why cramming for school exams late at night can work, and why watching a scary movie before bed will give you nightmares. This is also why reading good bedtime stories is so important for children, not just to get them to fall asleep, but because the repeated messages, lessons, and morals of the story become part of the fabric of the child's consciousness. As you drift off to sleep, you enter into the alpha brain wave state of consciousness, a state in which you are very suggestible. If you drift off to sleep after watching the late news, that is what you'll be imprinting into your consciousness. War, crime, automobile accidents, rape, robbery, murder, gang wars, drive-by shootings, kidnappings, and corporate scandals. Think how much better it would be to read an inspirational autobiography or a self-improvement book instead. You imagine the power of meditating, listening to a self-help audio program, or taking the time to plan your next day right before you go to sleep. Here are two exercises that will keep you positively focused and moving forward at the end of the day. The Evening Review This is a powerful exercise to help you more quickly install a new positive behavior, like punctuality, habit, like listening more, or quality, like patience or mindfulness. You'll be amazed at how fast this technique can lead to permanent change. Sit with your eyes closed. Breathe deeply and give yourself one of the following directions. Show me where I could have been more effective today. Show me where I could have been more conscious today. Show me where I could have been a better fill-in-your-profession, manager, teacher, coach, salesperson, etc. today. Show me where I could have been more loving today. Show me where I could have been more assertive today. Show me where I could have been more fill in any quality or characteristic today. As you sit calmly in a state of quiet receptivity, you'll see that a number of events from the day will come to mind. Just observe them without any judgment or self-criticism. When no more events come to mind, take each incident and replay it in your mind the way you would have preferred to have done it had you been more conscious and intentional at the time. This creates a subconscious image that will help evoke the desired behavior the next time a similar situation occurs. Create Your Ideal Day Another powerful tool to keep you focused on creating your life exactly as you want it to be is to take a few minutes after you have planned your next day's schedule and visualize the entire day going exactly as you want it. Visualize everyone being there when you call them, every meeting starting and ending on time, all of your priorities being handled, all of your errands being completed with ease, making every sale, and so on. See yourself performing at your best in every situation you will encounter during the next day. This will give your subconscious all night to work on creating ways to make it all happen just as you have visualized it. We also now know that every thought you think is broadcast out to the universe on what my friend and success coach Robert Scheinfeld calls the Internet. 
So when you are visualizing your ideal day, you are also sending out your intention to the other people involved through what the physicists call the quantum field. Get into the habit now of visualizing your ideal next day the night before. It will make a huge difference in your life. Principle 28 Clean up your messes and your incompletes. If a cluttered desk is the sign of a cluttered mind, what is the significance of a clean desk? Lawrence J. Peter, American educator and author. The cycle of completion. Decide, plan, start, continue, finish, complete. It's called the cycle of completion. Each of these steps, decide, plan, start, continue, finish, and complete, is required to succeed at anything, to get a desired result, to finish. Yet how many of us never complete? We get all the way through the finishing stage, but leave one last thing undone. Are there areas in your life when you've left uncompleted projects or failed to get closure with people? When you don't complete the past, you can't be free to fully embrace the present. Failing to complete robs you of valuable attention units. When you start a project or make an agreement or identify a change you need to make, it goes into your present memory bank and takes up what I call an attention unit. We can only pay attention to so many things at one time, and each promise, agreement, or item on your to-do list leaves fewer attention units to dedicate to completing present tasks and bringing new opportunities in abundance into your life. So why don't people complete? Often, incompletes represent areas in our life where we are not clear or where we have emotional and psychological blocks. For instance, you might have a lot of requests, projects, tasks, and other things on your desk you really want to say no to but you're afraid of being perceived as the bad guy, so you put off responding in order to avoid saying no. Meanwhile, the sticky notes and stacks of paper pile up and distract you. There may also be circumstances in which you have to make decisions that are difficult or uncomfortable, so rather than struggle with the discomfort, you let the incompletes pile up. Some incompletions come from simply not having adequate systems, knowledge, or expertise for handling these tasks. Other incompletions pile up because of our bad work habits. Get into completion consciousness. Continually ask yourself, what does it take to actually get this task completed? Then you can begin to consciously take that next step of filing completed documents, mailing in the forms required, or reporting back to your boss that the project has been completed. The truth is that 20 things completed have more power than 50 things half-completed. One finished book, for instance, that can go out and influence the world, is better than 13 books you're in the process of writing. Rather than starting 15 projects that end up incomplete and take up space in the house, you'd be better off if you had started just three and completed them. The Four Ds of Completion one way to take care of to-do items is something we've all seen in time management courses, the four Ds. Do it, delegate it, delay it, or dump it. When you pick up a piece of paper, decide then and there whether you'll ever do anything with it. If not, dump it. If you can take care of it within ten minutes, do it immediately. If you still want to take care of it yourself but know it'll take longer, delay it by filing it in a folder of things to do later. If you can't do it yourself or don't want to take the time, delegate it to someone you trust to accomplish the task. Be sure to have the person report back when he or she finishes the task so that you know it is complete. Making space for something new. In addition to professional incompletes, most households are also groaning under the weight of too much clutter, too many papers, worn-out clothes, unused toys forgotten personal effects, and obsolete, broken, and unneeded items. In the United States, the entire mini-storage industry has sprung up to help homeowners and small businesses store what they no longer can fit into their homes and offices. 
But do we really need all this stuff? Of course not. One of the ways to free up attention units is to free your living and work environments from the mental burden of all this clutter. When you clear out the old, you also make room for something new. Take a look at your clothes closet, for instance. If you've got one of those where you can't put another thing into it, where you struggle to pull out a dress or shirt, that may be one reason why you don't have more new clothes. There's nowhere to put them. If you haven't worn something in six months, and it's not a seasonal or a special occasion item, such as an evening gown or tuxedo, get rid of it. If there's anything new that you want in your life, gotta make room for it. I mean that psychologically as well as physically. If you want a new man in your life, you've got to let go of, forgive and forget, the last one you stopped dating five years ago. Because if you don't, when a new man meets you, the unspoken message he picks up is, this woman's attached to somebody else. She hasn't let go. A woman in one of my seminars admitted that for years she kept piles of books and magazines on her bed, a collection that eventually covered over half the available sleeping space. When she also mentioned that she had suffered terribly from a broken romantic relationship, it was instantly obvious to me that covering half her bed with piles of reading material was her unconscious way of making sure there was no space for a man who might be romantically interested in her. Not only had she failed to complete the past— the part of her that was afraid of being hurt again was making darn sure a similar unwanted future didn't show up either. After helping her see the connection between this self-imposed barrier and the lack of romance in her life, she used EFT tapping to release her fear of being hurt. See page 304. Cleared the clutter off her bed and made her bedroom inviting and welcoming again. Within months, she met a wonderful man who has become the love of her life. My good friend Martin Root once told me that whenever he wants to bring in new business, he thoroughly cleans his office, home, car, and garage. Every time he does, he starts getting calls and letters from people who want to work with him. Others find that doing spring cleaning helps them gain new clarity on problems, challenges, opportunities, and relationships. When we don't throw away clutter and items we no longer need, it's as if we don't trust our ability to manifest the necessary abundance in our lives to buy new ones when we need them. But incompletes like this keep that very abundance from showing up. We need to complete the past so that our present has the space to show up more fully. 25 Ways to Complete Before Moving Forward How many things do you need to complete? dump, or delegate before you can move on and bring new activity, abundance, relationships, and excitement into your life. Use this checklist to jog your thinking, make a list, and then write down how you'll complete each task. Once you've made your list, choose four items and start completing them. Choose those that would immediately free up the most time, energy, or space for you, whether it's mental space or physical space. At minimum, I encourage you to clean up one major incomplete every three months. If you want to really get the ball rolling, schedule a completion weekend and devote two full days to handling as many things on the following list as possible. 1. Former business activities that need completion. 2. Promises not kept, not acknowledged, or not renegotiated. 3. Unpaid debts or financial commitments money owed to others or to you. 4. Closets overflowing with clothing never worn. 5. A disorganized garage crowded with old discards. 6. Haphazard or disorganized tax records. 7. Checkbook not balanced or accounts that should be closed. 8. Junk drawers full of unusable items. 9. Missing or broken tools. 10. An attic filled with unused items. 11. A card trunk or back seat full of trash. 12. Incomplete car maintenance. 13. A disorganized basement filled with discarded items. 14. 
credenza packed with unfiled or incomplete projects. 15. Filing left undone. 16. Computer files not backed up or data needing to be converted for storage. 17. Desk surface cluttered or disorganized. 18. Family pictures never put into an album. 19. Mending, ironing, or other piles of items to repair or discard. 20. Deferred household maintenance. 21. Personal relationships with unstated requests, resentments, or appreciations. 22. People you need to forgive. 23. Time not spent with people you've been meaning to spend time with. 24. Incomplete projects or projects delivered without closure or feedback. 25. Acknowledgements that need to be given or asked for. What's irritating you? Like incompletes, daily irritants are equally damaging to your success because they, too, take up attention units. Perhaps it is the missing button on your favorite suit that keeps you from wearing it to an important meeting, or the torn screen on your patio door that lets in annoying insects. One of the best things you can do to move further and faster along your success path is to fix, replace, mend, or get rid of those daily irritants that annoy you and stay on your mind. Tulane Me Danner, the author of Coach Yourself to Success, recommends walking through every room of your house, your garage, and all around your property, jotting down those things that irritate, annoy, or bother you, and then arranging to get each one handled. Of course, none of these may be urgent to your business or life-threatening to your family, but every time you notice them and wish they were different, they pull energy from you. They are subtly subtracting energy from your life instead of adding energy to your life. They are expiring you rather than inspiring you. Another negative psychological impact of not handling those incompletes and tolerating those things that irritate you is that it creates a state of resignation in you that affects your belief in your ability to achieve your bigger goals. Subconsciously, your mind is thinking, if I can't find a stapler when I want it, and my filing system is dysfunctional, what makes me think I can start my own company or become a millionaire? Consider hiring a professional organizer to get you started. The mission of the National Association of Professional Organizers, NAPO, is to help you declutter your life and build systems to ensure that things stay that way. You may need someone who has a dispassionate eye to look beyond your attachments, familiarity, and fears, and be neutral in a way you can't. Plus, NAPO members are experts in how to make things efficient and easy. It's their profession. For about the cost of several business lunches, you can hire an organizer from your local area for a day of work. Additionally, you can hire people to clean your home, as well as handle all the little irritants, maintenance chores, and other tasks you either don't want to do or aren't skilled enough to do. If your finances don't allow for a professional organizer, ask a friend to help. Hire a neighborhood teen or the stay-at-home mom down the street. You can also read one of the many good how-to books and tackle things yourself. I recommend my favorites at www.thesuccessprinciples.com forward slash resources. Just remember that you don't need to get it done all at once. Choose one each month. Just as cleaning up your incompletes is important to your successful future, there is literally no excuse for enduring the disorganization in your life. Principle 29 Complete the past to embrace the future. None of us can change our yesterdays but all of us can change our tomorrows. Colin Powell, former Secretary of State of the United States of America under President George W. Bush. Does this sound familiar? Some people go through life as if they have a big anchor behind them, weighing them down. If they could release it, they would be able to move faster and succeed more easily. Perhaps that's you, holding on to past hurts, past incompletes, past anger or fear. 
Yet releasing these anchors can often be the final step you need to complete your past and embrace the future. I have known people who have forgiven their parents and doubled their income in the ensuing few months, as well as doubled their productivity and doubled their ability to achieve things. I have known others who have forgiven their aggressors for past harm and been relieved of actual physical ailments. The truth is, we need to let go of the past to embrace the future. One method I use for this is called the Total Truth Process. The Total Truth Process and Total Truth Letter The Total Truth Process and the Total Truth Letter are two tools to help you release negative emotions from the past and come back to your natural state of love and joy in the present. I want to thank John Gray and Barbara DeAngelis who first taught me this process. The reason I call it total truth is that often when we're upset, we fail to communicate all our true feelings to the person we're upset with. We get stuck at the level of anger or pain and rarely move past it to emotional completion. As a result, it can be difficult to feel close to, or even at ease with, the other person after such an angry or painful confrontation. The total truth process helps you express all your true feelings, so you can recapture the caring, closeness, and cooperation that is your natural state. The process is designed so as not to let you dump or discharge negative emotions onto another person but to allow you to move through the negative emotions and release them so that you can return to the state of love and acceptance that is your natural state of being, and from which joy and creativity can flow. The Stages of the Total Truth Process The Total Truth Process can be conducted verbally or in writing. Whichever method you choose, the goal is to express the anger, hurt, and fear and then move toward understanding, forgiveness, and love. If you do it verbally, always with the other person's permission, begin by expressing your anger, and then move through each stage all the way to the final stage of love, compassion, and forgiveness. You can use the following prompts to keep you focused at each stage. For the process to be effective, you need to spend an equal amount of time on each of the six stages. One. Anger and Resentment I'm angry that I hate it when I'm fed up with I resent 2. Hurt It hurt me when I felt sad when I feel hurt that I feel disappointed about 3. Fear I was afraid that I feel scared when I get afraid of you when I'm afraid that I 4. Remorse, regret, and accountability I'm sorry that Please forgive me for I'm sorry for I didn't mean to 5. Wants All I ever want or wanted I want you to I want or wanted. I deserve. 6. Love, compassion, forgiveness, and appreciation. I understand that. I appreciate. I love you for. I forgive you for. Thank you for. If you're uncomfortable doing it verbally, or if the other person cannot or will not participate, you can put your feelings in writing using the Total Truth Letter to express your true feelings. The Total Truth Letter Follow these steps when writing a Total Truth Letter. 1. Write a letter to the person who has upset you, with roughly equal portions of the letter expressing each of the feelings in the Total Truth process. 2. If the other party is not someone who is likely to agree to cooperate with this process, you may choose to simply throw the letter away once you have completed it. Remember, the main purpose here is to get you free from the unexpressed emotions, not to necessarily change the other person. 3. If the person you are upset with is willing to participate, have him or her write a total truth letter to you, too. 
Then exchange letters. Both of you should be present when you read the letters. Then discuss the experience. Avoid trying to defend your position. Make an effort to understand where the other person is coming from as you read their letter. After some practice, you may find you can go through the six stages of the process quickly and less formally, but in times of great difficulty, you will still want to use the six stages as a guideline. Forgive and move on. As long as you don't forgive, who and whatever it is will occupy rent-free space in your mind. Isabel Holland, award-winning author of 28 books. Although it may seem unusual to mention forgiveness in a book on how to become more successful, the reality is that anger, resentment, and the desire for revenge can waste valuable energy that could be more effectively applied toward positive, goal-directed action. In light of the law of attraction, we have already discussed that you attract more of whatever feelings you are experiencing. Being negative, angry, or unforgiving about a past hurt only ensures that you'll continue to attract more of the same into your life. Forgive and bring yourself back to the present. In the world of business, in families, and in personal relationships, we too need to come from a place of love and forgiveness, to let go so that we can move on. You need to forgive a business partner who lied to you and hurt you financially. You need to forgive a co-worker who stole credit for your work or gossiped about you behind your back. You need to forgive an ex-spouse who cheated on you, then got nasty during the divorce. You needn't condone their actions, or ever trust them again. But you do need to learn whatever lessons there are, forgive the other person, and move on. When you do forgive, it puts you back in the present, where good things can happen to you, and where you can take action to create future gains for yourself, your team, your company, and your family. Staying mired in the past uses valuable energy and robs you of the power you need to forge ahead in the creation of what you want. But it's so hard to let go. I know how hard it can be to forgive and let go. I've been kidnapped and assaulted by a stranger, been physically abused by an alcoholic father, been the victim of reverse racism, had employees embezzle serious amounts of money from me, been sued in some blatantly frivolous lawsuits, and been taken advantage of in a number of business dealings. But after each experience, I did the work of processing it and forgiving the other party, because I knew that if I didn't, these past hurts would eat away at me and prevent me from focusing my full attention on enjoying the present and creating the future life I wanted. With each experience, I also learned how to avoid letting it happen again. I learned how to better follow my intuition. I learned how to better protect myself, my family, and my hard-earned assets. And each time I finally released the experience, I felt lighter, freer, and stronger, with more energy to focus on the more important tasks at hand. There was no more negative self-talk, no more bitter recriminations. Resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. Nelson Mandela, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. Whatever hurts you are feeling, know that I've felt many of them too, but also know that what can hurt you even more is harboring the resentment, holding a grudge, and rerunning the same hatred over and over. The word forgive really means to give it up for yourself, not for them. I've had people in my seminars who, when they finally truly forgive someone, release long-term migraine headaches within minutes, find immediate relief from chronic constipation and colitis, release their arthritis pain, improve their eyesight, and immediately experience a host of other physical benefits. One man actually lost six pounds in the next two days without changing his eating habits. I have also seen people subsequently create miracles in their careers and financial lives. Believe me, it is definitely worth the intention and the effort. Steps to Forgiving The following steps are all integral to forgiving. 1. Acknowledge your anger and resentment. 2. 
Acknowledge the hurt and pain it created. 3. Acknowledge the fears and self-doubts that it created. 4. Acknowledge any part you may have played in letting the behavior or the event occur or letting it continue. 5. Acknowledge what you were wanting that you didn't get, and then put yourself in the other person's shoes and attempt to understand where he or she was coming from at that time, and what needs they were trying to meet, however inelegantly, by their behavior. 6. Let go and forgive the person. If you're paying attention, you probably notice that these steps involve the same six stages as the total truth process. Make a list. Make a list of anyone you feel has hurt you and how. Blank hurt me by blank. Then one by one, taking as many days as you need, go through the total truth process with each person. You can do it as a written process or a verbal process where you pretend you are talking to the person who is sitting in an empty chair across from you. Make sure you take ample time to think about what must have been going on in each person's life at the time to make him or her do whatever they did to you. Remember that all people, including you, are always doing the best they can to meet their basic needs with the awareness, knowledge, skills, and tools they have at the time. If they could have done better, they would have done better. As they develop more awareness of how their behavior affects others, and as they learn more effective and less harmful ways to meet their needs, they will behave in less harmful ways. Think about it. No parent ever wakes up in the morning and says to his or her mate, I've just figured out three more ways we can screw up the kids. Parents are always doing the best they can to be good parents. But the combination of their own psychological wounds, their lack of knowledge and parenting skills, and the pressure of their lives often converge to create behaviors that hurt us. It is not personal to you. They would have done the same thing to anyone who was in your shoes at that moment. The same is true for everyone else in your life, all the time. If they can do it, you can do it. In my search over the years for inspirational stories for the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, I have found many stories of forgiveness that let me know that human beings can forgive anything, no matter how tragic or brutal. In 1972, the Pulitzer Prize was awarded for a photograph of a young Vietnamese girl, her arms outstretched in terror and pain, running naked, her clothes having been seared from her body, and screaming from her village which had just been bombed with napalm in the Vietnam War. That photo was reprinted thousands of times around the world, can still be found in high school history books. That day, Fan T. Kim Phuc suffered third-degree burns over more than half of her body. After 17 operations and 14 months of painful rehabilitation, Kim miraculously survived. Having overcome her painful past through a process of forgiveness, she is now a Canadian citizen, goodwill ambassador for the United Nations Educational and Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, and the founder of the Kim Foundation, which helps innocent victims of war. Everyone who has ever met Kim comments on the amazing quality of peace that radiates from her. In 1978, Simon Weston joined the Welsh Guards in Great Britain. As part of the Falklands Task Force, he was aboard the Sir Galahad when it was bombed by Argentine planes. His face was badly disfigured, as he suffered burns over 49% of his body. He has undergone 70 operations since that fateful day, and will still have to endure more. It would be easy for him to spend the rest of his life being bitter. Instead, he says, if you spend your life full of recriminations and bitterness— then you failed yourself, failed the surgeons and nurses and everyone else, because you aren't giving anything back. Hatred can consume you, and it's wasted emotion. Instead of drowning in a sea of bitterness, Simon has become an author, a motivational speaker, and the co-founder and vice president of Weston Spirit, a non-profit organization that has worked with tens of thousands of young people whose lifestyles reflect a poverty of aspiration in the United Kingdom. Like Simon and Kim, 
you can transcend and triumph, too. Tapping away past hurts. Of course, many of these past hurts get stored in the mind, and even in the body, affecting all our future actions and decisions. For many people in my trainings, getting past their past is difficult, painful, and, until the last decade or so, very difficult, particularly if they have experienced violence, trauma, or abuse early in life. But over the last ten years, I've been using a little-known but highly effective, drug-free, and non-invasive way to reduce or eliminate this post-traumatic stress with individuals I work with. It also helps reduce chronic pain, anxiety, phobias, and fears, limiting beliefs, plus many stress-related medical conditions. The technique is so powerful that it has been used with genocide victims in Rwanda and Bosnia, for disaster victims in Haiti, and is even used by a trainer of the British Special Forces in the Congo, and with U.S. soldiers returning with post-traumatic stress disorder from the battlefield. Called tapping therapy, it stimulates the body's own ability to release stored pain of any kind. And the results are nothing short of miraculous. For thousands of years, Eastern cultures have focused their methods for healing medical conditions on stimulating energy meridians, or pathways, throughout the body. These energy pathways send electrical impulses throughout the body to keep all systems working. But, in addition to moving and storing energy, it was discovered they also store emotions. Some healthcare professionals even believe that an illness or chronic pain in a specific area of the body is the result of a specific emotional pain stored in that meridian. Thirty-four years ago, clinical psychologist Dr. Roger Callahan, the originator of tapping therapy, discovered that you could stimulate the instant release of these stored emotions by tapping along these meridians in acupressure-like fashion, while focusing your mind on the past hurt or current stress, phobia, fear, or anxiety. He called his method Thought Field Therapy, or TFT. And today, Dr. Callahan's Institute trains practicing therapists, healthcare professionals, and everyday people in how to use TFT both in clinical settings and at home. Others, most notably Gary Craig and Nick Ortner, have brought TFT to the masses as the Emotional Freedom Technique, EFT, and Meridian Tapping Therapy. My book, Tapping into Ultimate Success, describes how to use tapping to free yourself from these stored anxieties, stresses, and emotional hurts, and focuses on helping you to better implement the principles in this book, The Success Principles, by tapping away any limiting beliefs, fears, and internal obstacles that arise when you are attempting to apply any of the principles. The first part of the tapping protocol is to close your eyes, Focus on the fear, anxiety, emotion, pain, or belief that you wish to release, and then determine on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being high, how intense the feeling or belief is. The basic tapping sequence to eliminate fears and negative beliefs and to neutralize negative events then starts by tapping the karate chop spot on the heel of your hand 10 times, firmly enough to feel it but not hard enough to bruise your hand. As you tap your hand, repeat aloud the belief, physical pain, or experience of hurt you are dealing with, as you, most important, tune in to the emotion that belief or hurt brings forth. Follow your statement of the belief or hurt with the affirmation, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. For example, even though I'm afraid to ask for a raise, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Or, even though I believe I don't deserve to be successful, I deeply and completely love and accept myself. Once you've tapped the karate chop spot ten times, begin the EFT tapping sequence here while continuing to focus on the past hurt, limiting belief, emotion, stress, pain, or source of anxiety. Tap five to seven times firmly at each point. Accompany each tapping point with a statement that keeps you focused on the emotion, like this. One, top of the head. 
I'm afraid to ask for a raise. 2. Eyebrow. I'm afraid to ask for a raise. 3. Outside of eye. I'm afraid he'll say no, and I'll be embarrassed. 4. Under the eye. I'll be embarrassed. 5. Under the nose. I'll be so embarrassed if he says no. 6. Chin. I'll be mortified if he says no. 7. Collarbone. I'm afraid to ask for a raise. 8. Under the arm. I'll be so embarrassed. The exact words you say aren't important. What's important is that you are continually tuned in to your emotion. Additionally, you can tap the eyebrow, under the eye, collarbone, and under the arm spots on either side of your body. Repeat the sequence, repeating your phrase again and again, until you feel the intensity has dropped down to a one or is totally gone. Tapping therapy also works miraculously for serious phobias of all kinds. Actress and talk show host Kelly Ripa had a severe fear of flying, resulting from the trauma of watching airplanes hit the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001. When her producers wanted to tape the Live with Regis and Kelly show from Disneyland in California, she knew she needed to overcome her fear of flying in order to make the trip. Working with Dr. Callahan, who treated her with tapping therapy over the phone in New York, she was able to comfortably get on a plane and make the five-hour flight. Kelly was so delighted that she invited Dr. Callahan on the TV show to treat amusement park guests for their fear of roller coasters. Seventeen people rode a whopper of a roller coaster just moments later, with most saying they wanted to ride again. I have used tapping to help people in my seminars overcome the fear of flying, fear of public speaking, fear of singing in front of others, fear of heights, claustrophobia, and the fear of drowning. Here is what Sharon Worsley, one of my Train the Trainer students, posted on the Internet. Having been a swimmer when I was younger, I had two bad experiences where I nearly drowned at age 12 and 15. For the rest of my life, I was not able to go back into the water. In fact, if I were to speak to you about swimming, I would start to get a physical reaction where my head would start to rise as if I was trying to prevent myself from going under in an imaginary pool. It was debilitating, as I was missing out on having fun with my friends when I traveled as they were enjoying the pool or the ocean, and I was sitting there watching them. Plus, I didn't like this feeling of disempowerment. Well, all that changed on a hot night in June 2010. It was the last night of Jack Canfield's inaugural Train the Trainer program where I was a participant. There I was watching my fellow attendees enjoy the spectacular pool at the Fairmont Scottsdale Princess while I had been standing on the sideline. A friend did eventually coax me into the pool somehow, but I couldn't get into the water past my hips, and I was feeling extremely anxious. Jack heard about this and came over to see if he could help me. Then a seemingly impossible miracle happened. Within minutes of Jack using the tapping method on me, I not only went deeper into the water, but I was soon swimming around, including floating on my back unaided, something that I had figured would never happen again. I have since been swimming and no longer have any hesitation or fear. So as you can see, with the amazing power of this simple technique, there is no longer any reason to let fear, limiting beliefs, or past hurts and traumas stop you from achieving anything you want. Principle 30 Face What Isn't Working Facts do not cease to exist because they are ignored. Aldous Huxley, visionary writer. Our lives improve only when we take chances, and the first and most difficult risk we can take is to be honest with ourselves. Walter Anderson, editor of Parade Magazine for 20 years. If you are going to become more successful, you have to get out of denial and face what isn't working in your life. Do you defend or ignore how toxic your work environment is? Do you make excuses for your bad marriage? Are you in denial about your lack of energy, your excess weight, 
your ill health, or your level of physical fitness? Are you failing to acknowledge that sales have been on a consistent downward trend for the last three months? Are you putting off confronting an employee who is not delivering at an acceptable standard of performance? Successful people face these circumstances squarely, heed the warning signs, and take appropriate action, no matter how uncomfortable or challenging it might be. Remember the yellow alerts. Remember E plus R equals O and the yellow alerts in Principle 1? Yellow alerts are all those little signals you get when something's not right. Your teen comes home late from school again. Strange notices show up in the company mail. A friend or neighbor makes an odd comment. Sometimes we choose to acknowledge these alerts and take action. But more often than not, we simply choose to ignore them. We pretend not to notice that something's amiss. Why? Because to face what's not working in your life usually means you're going to have to do something uncomfortable. You might have to exercise more self-discipline, confront somebody, risk not being liked, ask for what you want, demand respect instead of settling for an abusive relationship, or maybe even quit your job. But because you don't want to do these uncomfortable things, you'll often defend tolerating a situation that doesn't work. What does denial look like? Though the bad situations in our lives can be uncomfortable, embarrassing, and painful, we often live with them, or worse, we hide them behind myths, widely accepted views, and platitudes. We don't even realize we are in denial. We use phrases such as these. It's just what guys do. You can't control teenagers these days. He's just venting his frustrations. It's got nothing to do with me. It's none of my business. It's not my place to say. I don't want to rock the boat. There's nothing I can do about it. Don't wash your dirty linen in public. Credit card debt like this is normal. I'll get fired if I say anything. Mom's church friends check on her. Luckily, it's only marijuana. She's just at that age. I need these to help me relax. I have to work these long hours to get ahead. We just have to wait it out. I'm sure he's going to pay it back. Occasionally, we'll even make up reasons why something that is not working is working, not realizing that if we would just acknowledge the bad situation sooner, it would often be less painful to resolve. It would be cheaper. The circumstances might be more beneficial. The problems would be easier to solve. We could be more honest with everyone concerned. We would feel better about ourselves, and we would certainly have more integrity. But we have to get past our denial. Successful people, on the other hand, are more committed to finding out why things are going wrong and fixing them than they are to defending their own position or maintaining their ignorance. In business, they look at the hard truth in real numbers, rather than recalculating the numbers to look good to the stockholders. They want to know why someone didn't use their product or service, why the ad campaign didn't work, or why expenditures are unusually high. They are rational and in touch with reality. They are willing to look at what is and deal with it rather than hide it and deny it. Doing more of what doesn't work won't make it work any better. Charles J. Givens, real estate investment strategist and author of Wealth Without Risk. Know when to hold them. Know when to fold them. A big part of getting out of denial is to get good at recognizing bad situations and then deciding to do something about them. It always amazes me how difficult recognition and decision is for most people even when it comes to alcoholism and drug addiction. With many addicts, their marriages fail, their businesses fail, they lose their house, and even end up on skid row before they realize their addiction is not working for them. Fortunately, most of our problems are less severe than drug addiction, but that doesn't make the recognition or decision any easier. Take your job, for instance. Are you in denial about what you would really like to be doing? Worse yet, 
Do you constantly talk about how happy and fulfilled you are when you're not? Are you living a lie? Workaholics are a perfect example of this kind of denial. A high-pressure schedule can't possibly work long-term for anyone. But most workaholics will defend it with comments such as, I'm making great money. This is how I support my family. It's how I get ahead. And I have to do it to compete at the office. As we've explored already, defending and justifying a bad situation is really just a form of denial. Denial is based on fear. Often denial is based on the notion that something even worse will happen if we stop our denial and take corrective action. In other words, we're afraid to face the truth. Many a therapist can tell you that, in spite of overwhelming clues that their spouse is having an affair, many patients won't confront their spouse over it. They simply don't want to face the fact that their marriage might be over. They don't want to deal with the emotional stress and the physical inconvenience of a divorce. They don't want to deal with the financial upheaval or the possibility that they might have to move or get a job. What are some of the situations you are afraid to deal with? Your teenager who is smoking or doing drugs? A supervisor who leaves early but dumps his late projects on you? A business partner who doesn't do his fair share of the work or spends too much money? Your house payment or expenses that are unmanageable? Your aging parents who now need full-time care? Your health, which is becoming a problem because of a poor diet or lack of exercise? A spouse who is never home, withdrawn, disrespectful, abusive, or supercritical? Not enough free time for yourself or your children? Though many of the situations above may require drastic changes in how you live, work, and relate to others, remember that the solution to these problems isn't always to quit your job, get a divorce, fire the employee, or ground your teenager. It may be more productive to choose less extreme alternatives, such as a discussion with your boss, marriage counseling, setting boundaries with your teens and siblings, scaling back your expenditures, or seeking competent professional help. Of course, these less drastic solutions still require you to face your fears and take action. But you have to face what isn't working first. The good news is that the more you face uncomfortable situations, the better you get at it. When you face just one thing that isn't working, the next time you have the slightest inkling, you are more likely to take action immediately. And the sooner you take action, the easier it is to clean up. Remember the old saying, a stitch in time saves nine? It's true. Take action now. Take the time right now to make a list of what isn't working in your life. Start with the seven major areas where you would normally set goals, financial, career or business, free time or family time, health and appearance, relationships, personal growth, and making a difference. Ask your family, friends, employees, co-workers, class, group, coach, or team what they believe is not working. Ask, what's not working? How can we improve it? What requests can I make? What do you need from me? What do I or we need to do? What action steps can I or we take to get each of these situations to work the way I or we would like? Do you need to talk to someone? Call a repair person? Ask someone for help? Learn a new skill? Find a new resource? Read a book? Call an expert? Make a plan to fix it? Choose one action you can take and then do it. Then keep taking another action and another action until you get the situation resolved. Principle 31 Embrace change. Change is the law of life, and those who look only to the past or present are certain to miss the future. John F. Kennedy, 35th President of the United States. Change is inevitable. At this very moment, for instance, your body and cells are changing. The earth is changing. The economy, technology, how we do business, even how we communicate is changing. 
And though you can resist that change and potentially be swept away by it, you can also choose to cooperate with it, adapt to it, and benefit from it. Grow or Die In 1910, Florist's Telegraph Delivery, known today as FTD, was founded by 15 American florists who began using the telegraph to exchange orders and deliver flowers to customers' loved ones thousands of miles away. Gone were the days when a daughter or sister would go to the local florist and order a small bouquet. Family members were relocating to cities and towns far from home. And FTD flourished by identifying this trend and combining it with the telegraph, which represented a change in the way we communicate. Around the same time, the American railroad industry began to see the automobile and the airplane as new technologies designed to transport people and goods from place to place. But unlike other industries, who readily embraced these new machines, the railroad industry resisted, believing instead that they were in the railroad business, not the business of transporting goods and people. They didn't realize what they were up against. They didn't grow. Though businesses focusing on the railroads might have become automobile and aircraft businesses, they didn't. As a result, they almost died out. <laughs>